Hi guys, and welcome back to another edition of The Big Shift. And today I've got a fascinating international guest, unbelievable story. He was a, a main Gambino enforcer and hitman. His story, guys, I tell you, it's really something. I'm just going to get straight into it. Uh, my guest today is John Aloy. Welcome, John. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Stephen, for having me. I appreciate it. John, you've got an unbelievable story. Thanks for coming on, you know. And look, you know, I want to get straight into it. Uh, we have a lot of synergies in our, in, our, uh, in our life journeys. One of the things I was interested in was about your father and how you actually got into mob life. Could you tell us a little bit about your father and the influence he had on you growing up? Yeah, my father was an immigrant from Albania, which later on becomes a communist country. But he came here as a kid. He lived down on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which back then was the uh, the mafia hub, Vito Genovese, guys like that, that were down there. And later on, he moved over to Jersey area, got involved with uh, guys like little Al Greco, who's uh, actually doing a life sentence now, uh, a prolific killer, a tough guy, uh, handsome Jack. And, you know, these guys were uh, Jersey-bound guys that uh, Lucky Luciano's cousin, Charlie Luciano, we should call Blackie. And I grew up as, uh, like, their nephew. You know, typical mob life story where you're, you're on their laps and you're in gambling dens at three and four years old and you're introduced to see guys, you know, giving you five and ten and even a hundred bucks back then. And, you know, I started being uh, impressed with that life. And then in Queens uh, was another mob situation where – the whole neighborhood were gangsters. And one of my uh, childhood friends that was around their family, who was a very famous gangster, Fat Andy Ruggiano. Uh, these guys were all gamblers like my dad. The, their sons also, Albert and Anthony, were always at the track and they knew my father. So my father was around the mob guys since he's a kid, which brought me around these guys since I'm a baby. And, you know, I just stepped into that world as, you know, born into that world. So was your father affiliated with these guys? Was he, you know, was it the gambling because that was the channel? Or was it just people in the neighborhood? You know, he was a stand-up guy and he hung out with John. I'm trying to get the influence, you know, and where it started, uh, what it was actually like for you. Well, you know, it was both with my father. He was involved, but he wasn't, you know, he didn't do what I did. He wasn't, uh, he was a boxer. He was in a ring his whole life. I uh, grew up, like I said, around Vito Genovese and these guys in the neighborhood. You know, he actually hit the front page of the Daily News. Him, this guy, Red Kelly, uh, an Irish friend of his that had a problem with a cop. And uh, they beat the cop up. The cop ended up shooting uh, Red about six times. He ended up living. And him and my Uncle Max. Uh, so it was a little bit of both. Uh, he was on a gambling tip, but he was also around all these gangsters since he's a kid. So he kind of introduced me to everybody. And... And then he met the Ruggianos uh, through the track. So uh, that's how I got familiar with them. And I got involved in baseball with them, boxing and hanging around the father and the sons. So did he, you know, he obviously had this life around him. You know, it was part of your everyday life. But did he steer you away from the life, John? Or, you know, did he want you to become a sportsman? Or did he say, look, son, you know, this is part of the life. These guys, you know, we respect these guys are a certain kind of guys. You know, but what I want for you, my son, is I want something else. How is it with that, John? Yeah, he wanted me to be a, a tough guy w with my hands, you know, not, not on the street. He wanted me to be what he was. He wanted me to be a gambler and hang out with these guys, be friendly with them, but not become one of the guys that was going to be the shooter or the enforcer on the streets. Or, so he thought I could toe the line that he did. You know, hang out with them, gamble with them, play cards with them, play uh, dice with them, go to the track. And, you know, go to the, you know, the, the boxing ring with the, you know, most of the guys from our neighborhood were in the gyms, you know, especially back in those days. Everybody was, you know, at, down the gym. They were always boxing. And, you know, everybody was uh, more of a, you know, I think a street mentality because the money was different back in those days compared to today. So I think uh, he thought I could do what he did, just a friend, but not a killer. It was interesting, John. I heard you say one time about how strict he was, right? You know, that old school strict and bordering on brutal. I had the, I had the same experience from my father, Irish, big as a bear, right? Big, massive vans. He was brutal. You know, but looking back to the point, he kind of needed to be with us. You know, you know, all my brothers, all my... Uh, 
brothers was a handful. But looking back, I respected him for that in the way that what it was then. I mean, it's different now, you know. How was that for you? Do you, you know, did you always respect his strictness? I mean, obviously it didn't work, John, right? <laughs> uh, you know what? My, my dad was, uh, I, listen, first of all, I love my dad. So I'm not one of those guys that ever blames my father for anything. You know, my father gave, he did the best thing he thought he could do for me is uh, teach me to be, uh, not to get bullied, teach, teach me to be a fighter, not to let anybody push me around. But at the same time, uh, when my father was teaching me these things, it made me survive this life. You know, when people say, well, how'd you survive? His training and his belief of making me a professional athlete and a, and a tough guy, whether it's in a ring or it's playing baseball and just being a very aggressive kid is what really saved me in the street world. But his intentions were to keep me far away from uh, becoming a, an enforcer or a, a drug dealer or a killer or any other word we use for this. He just didn't want me on the street like that. Now, John, you know, there's a lot in the press. There's so much in the press about, you know, big lists of people you've, you've killed, baseball battered, all this stuff. Now, we both know how the press they escalate this stuff and it, it twists and it bends. You know, we're going to go there a little bit later on with this stuff and we're really going to go into the details of what actually happened with this stuff. But what was the first instinct in you, John, that pushed you forward with this kind of violent anger. For me, you know, I had the same kind of thing. I'm just really interested on what was the start of this inside you, John, that pushed you over that line. Well, you know, as a kid, you know, let's go at about five years old. I'm already in the ring. And believe it or not, at three, four years old, every day we're boxing. So at five years old, I, I get stepped into a racial tensions back in those days. So there's always aggressiveness in the, in the schools. Everybody's always fighting. We come from a, you know, a somewhat poverty area. Uh, it wasn't completely poverty, but it was, you know, lower middle class. And, you know, my family was lower class, I guess, financially. So, you know, that's going to throw you in a mix of uh, the street, right? Because of the money, because of the guys, my father's hanging around with, with the gambling and things like that. And I think that uh, just constantly fighting in the street or watching your friends fight, you're jumping in. And it's just part of our life. Just normal behavior in those days was just to fight. I mean, we'd be getting hit by my father. We get hit by our neighbors. We get hit by, you know, friends of my father. You know, it's just, that was the life. So everything was aggressive. That's what we were taught. And then I'm playing baseball for, you know, the most famous gangster around, Fat Andy Ruggiano. His sons are my coaches and I'm at their house and I'm, on, I'm playing in the schoolyard across the street from them. And, you know, everything we're being taught by everybody in our life is to be aggressive to play foot, you know, if you're playing football, to dive, not to, you know, you're not crying about blood. You know, it's just part of our life in sports and it became part of our life on the street. We're used to it. Yeah, so you was forged. You was forged, right, you know, and I get that. So what was the first extreme violence we thought, well, you know, I really didn't know that I, you know, this, this explosive thing in me where I just do serious damage. What was the first instance of that, John? I got to laugh because people ask me that and I always tell a different story, but the real thing is probably my brother. My brother was bigger than me. He was very good with his hands. He was very fast with his hands. He's a skinny guy. He was kind of like a, you know, like a Leonard or somebody that fought with Muhammad Ali, very light on his feet. And he was always giving me beatings. So, you know, he, and the same time he's my brother, he's giving me beatings, but if somebody else tried to fight with me, he'd jump in. So, you know, it's that brother relationship. So he gave me a beating one day and I picked up a stick you know, and, and I broke it over his ribs as kids. So, you know, and everybody said, that's your brother. I says, well, my brother kept hitting me. So, you know, my answer to that was, if I can't defend myself one way, I'm going to defend it another way, but I'm not going to lose the fight. My brother, even at the time later on, my brother, uh, you know, we were fighting another time and he threw me through a window by accident. So, you know, we were very crazy the way we fought. This is just our upbringing, our neighborhood. And I think it's just normal behavior for us. You know, we go at each other's throats, but then we'll kill for each other too. And I think that was my first time I actually really hurt anybody. It was my own brother. Yeah, this was in Queens, right? So, yeah, yeah. you know, you grew up with a lot of guys and look, you know, people would have known or would have heard about Gotti, Gotti Jr. You know, so we'll get him in here now quickly about, because there was, you know, there's been a lot said, John, about how you two grew up together. Was this the truth? Did you grow up together? Was it one of them things? You bumped into each other and further down the road, it, it, you know, something happened between you? How did that, you know, what was the proper thing with that? The thing is, listen, uh, 
he's not important in my life, but the father was. You know, he was raised around uh, an Irish guy, actually, that they went to school. The Irish guy went to school with, his name was Gebbett. He went to school with the, the Gotti's other son that died, unfortunately, in a, in a mini bike accident. So the, when he died, uh, Gotti started going to see this Irish guy. Later on, we killed this Irish guy, but this Irish guy was very friendly with, uh, with Gotti, and he brought him around to our neighborhood once in a while, and I'd see him here or there. And uh, eventually, the father had me working for him, and you know, was, you know, I used different terminologies depending how I feel that day. And, but you know, the guy was you know, a rich kid that uh, you know, his father became the boss. But the, you know, nothing like you know, who I talked about earlier, Albert and Anthony Ruggiano, these were gangsters, and they were around a very famous father who was a gangster, but he, they were brought up different. They were brought, brought up legitimately as street guys. That, you know, a guy from the street, you're from the street. We respect the guys that grew up like us. So if they didn't grow up with us and are a little spoiled and they don't carry themselves the way I think a man should carry himself as, you know, humble themselves and, uh, you know, just who he is. I mean, it's, it's okay that you grew up a, as a, a son of a, a gangster, but earn your way. And if you don't earn your way, stop trying to, you know, I don't know. I think he just doesn't know who he is. And I think I go through these conversations constantly. But they're not, he's definitely not like the Ruggiano family, put it that way. Yeah, I hear that, John. Thanks for that. You know, and I know uh, Anthony Ruggiano is there today. We're going to get Anthony in in a little while, you know, and I know that, you know, this is a family. These are people historically that go right the way back to the likes of Alba, Alba Anastasia, Vito uh, Genovese. These are, you know, these are icons of that, of that world, of that time, right? You know, we're going to go back to that, right? You know, and I'm looking forward to that too. So um, where did you start to get, we call it groomed. I mean, looking back, John, I know what it was. It was the older guys and I was certainly groomed in my own way. I was a loose cannon. So I elevate them guys. They don't really last too long, but you know, you know. So I elevated because of my family, you know, my environment. You know, I I I was elevated quickly in my journey. Right. How was it for you, John? Well, I, I think I was again. I was groomed by the Ruggianos. I was groomed by the father. Even if he wasn't talking to me, he was sitting there. You know, he would sit in his chair. He'd watch us play sports. He'd watch us at the gym. And I think I was groomed by. You know, I'm groomed by historic gangsters you know i was raised to to mimic them their actions and their son's actions so i learned from them at the very beginning as a kid whether it was anthony was older than me so if it was anthony or it was albert they teach us to be a little humble right and the father would teach the same thing but at the other side if there's a problem they taught us to be very aggressive so they taught us to hurt guys kill guys and, you know, one of the earliest things that happened to me is, and I was a fairly innocent kid at the time, I was about 15 years old, and a gangster from the neighborhood, this guy, Patty, tries to shoot me a couple of times. And I went to Albert and Anthony. This was no surprise. Of, you know, this is out in public for years now in the neighborhood. And they told me at that time, John, just stay home. And, I, and I'm like, and then they thought better of it. And they says, you know what? Go to this neighborhood bar. I was only a kid, but we used to get in the bars at 15, 16. And he said, go to and sit in there until you get a phone call from us. And I got a phone call from a pay phone and they threw the guy off a roof. So, you know, that was the answer. Then I understood, wow, I got a lot of power here. You know, it's not anymore, you know, just some, some kid in the neighborhood. And after this guy, the guy lives, they, they broke his neck, his, his arms, his, his hip. I mean, he was, he was uh, hurt pretty bad for about two years, actually recovering. And, you know, then I started realizing the guys in the neighborhood understood because whispers around the neighborhood. You know, this is Ruggiano's personal guy. And, uh, and, and, you know, and that's what the neighborhood's about, is those whispers and grooming into that lifestyle to understand the violence is what everybody respects. Whether we like it or not, that's the, 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 uh, the reality of the street. Absolutely. And look, you know, pe pe people can say what they want, you know, and they're entitled to their opinion. But there are certain really good values in any life or any culture conduct you can call it what you may, but there certainly are some really in-depth ones ingrained in people who have to survive on the street, certainly to be manly and to take care of their family. And there's good values in there, John, right? There's bad ones in there too, as we know. So look, what, what because we're all kind of marked in a way as, as we're groomed. I certainly was. So what was you targeted for 
to go into the life like tough guy, enforcer, you know, the violent guy who solved problems, troubleshooter, all of this. What singled you out early on in the early days that this was the path that was going to be your one, John? I think the the thing that really made me different was I was very quiet, you know, as a kid. Uh, people would say, look, he's, I was a small guy in statue. I wasn't intimidating. And people, you know, would say, well, he's a quite nice kid. But if they did something wrong, I never gave a warning. I went from that quiet guy to that same guy to put a bat across your head. So people didn't expect it. But I was raised, again, by guys like Fat Andy and the Sons, where we weren't supposed to talk about anything. We weren't supposed to intimidate anybody. We weren't supposed to be loud and boisterous. We were supposed to be gentlemen until somebody disrespects us. And when they do, make sure you hurt them bad or kill them. And it, there was no middle ground of, you know, you're on the street. You're a street guy now. You're a gangster. And we understood that once people feared us, uh, they weren't coming to punch you in the mouth anymore. They were coming to take your life. So you got to be very intellectually smart as far as like a cat and make sure that, you know, you don't run through those nine lives. So I started learning, you know, this was part of my grooming from these guys. And, you know, and I developed into the guy I am. I mean, today I'm a different guy, right? But you got guys typing away or guys talking because they know I'm not out there. You know, when they talk before, I didn't give no warning. I just waited outside and, you know, whether it's in a park or it's outside a garage or something, and then, you know, I'd shoot them in the head, I'd stab them up or, you know, th those days are gone for me. So it's easy for guys to, you know, continue writing and talking. How do you, how do you combat that? But you combat it in a different way now. You know, you, you look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, I've become a different man now. This is the stage of my life to be a gentleman. Life is certainly a journey, you know, and it's certainly about developing. And, um, you know, my experience is the serious guys are going to keep the energy. You're not going to see them coming and, you know, that's going to be the end of it. They're not the talkers, right? The ones right. who the, the easy ones, you know, because you can see them, you see where they are, right? Did you enjoy the violence, John? When you was younger, I'm talking about, you know, because we evolved, right? But when you was younger, uh, John, coming up as a young guy, did you enjoy the violence? You know, you know, the thing is, I think as a young guy, I enjoyed the violence. As an older guy, I can't lie, I think I still have that same feeling in me. It's just that, uh, I keep it in perspective that my life comes before me hurting somebody else was taking somebody's life. It's not like when I was young, when I was younger, I was very, yeah, it was a, it was a form of uh, power, a form of release, a form of uh, respect of the way I, I, when I walked in someplace, everybody was intimidated. They said, if this guy's here, he's only here for a reason. I'm here to hurt somebody, kill somebody. So, you know, in, in your own egotistical way, I think, you know, you kind of subconsciously know that you're, you're reading up that, that respect, even though that's not a, a good way to go through life. But unfortunately, that's the way I did go through life. Yeah, it's survival in many ways. It's, it's you know, it's more than that. You know, the greed comes into it and um, it is a tool. First and foremost, it's a tool to be used, right? So where did you start getting into the really every part of this finance, John? Let's start going forward a little bit now when you're really working for the Gambino family, crime family, and you're at the start of your integration, so you're a trusted guy, right? They're saying, like, you know what? This is a capable guy. We're going to start giving him some work. What was that like? How did that start? Uh, you know, again, I, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood. There's a million names you could throw out, but one of my little girlfriend's uh, father and uncles were uh, Lucchese bosses and uh, a skipper and a, and a made guy, and they had a bookmaking business. I'm a kid. And I'm 17 years old. He's asking me to collect some money for him. And, you know, I'm running around uh, collecting money. I'm under the umbrella, obviously. If I have a problem, I'll run just what I did to Anthony or Albert that can, you know, handle what I needed with the, you know, as far as uh, made guys or street guys or bosses. They'd intervene for me if I needed something. But as far as street guys, uh, when uh, this other guy's name was uh, Gaddy, not Gotti. Uh, Gaddy asked me to go collect some money for him. And I went and he didn't say go baseball bat the guy. He says, you know, get the money and, you know, go, go see this guy for me. And he didn't like the way the guy was talking. So the way he said it to me, I know he meant hurt him. And, you know, I went there and uh, knocked on his door. He opened the door. He was, you know, I was a fairly young kid, skinny. I had the bat behind my, my leg and I didn't talk. As soon as I opened the door, I started batting him. So I think, you know, that's how it started. You know, where uh, you, you, the energy is 
somewhat of anxiety, fear, and also aggressiveness. And to do the job right, because you don't want to be embarrassed. So it's not so much uh, you getting hurt. I don't think uh, it was, you wanted to be respected by these guys. So if you didn't do it right, and I think that's what made me the way I was in sports. I didn't want to lose. And I, I think that helped me on the street and helped me be very aggressive on the street. And I understood uh, my competition, some of them were dangerous. I was losing friends at an early age. A lot of my friends were dying at 14, 15, 16, not like a normal neighborhood. So I understood the consequences. So as an associate, you know, you're not, you're not fully Italian, right? You know, so you can never be made, you know, for guys out there who don't understand this life at all, John, right? You know, or the dynamics of how these relationships really are. What was, what was the deal with them for someone like you coming through to work with these guys who were the main body and the main guys and, you know, you would come in as an associate, not ever being looked at to be made, but certainly someone who could be marked as someone to, to be watched and be important, who could, who could, who was very capable. Well, I think it was a little different for me than an average guy that's not Italian because I grew up on the laps of, of all these guys. So I was accepted, although being Albanian, uh, I was accepted as being one of their own. And I think because of the, the family relationships I had, with the, whether it was the Ruggiano family later on with the Gotti family, uh, they, they gave me the access of, of uh, the treatment as if I was a made guy. For example, if you're going to the club on Saturdays, we used to have a dinner on Saturday afternoons with Gotti. There was a place at the table for me, which if you're not a made guy, you couldn't sit at that table, but there was a place for me. So Gotti made sure, uh, I'm talking about the father, would make sure that I was treated in, in a manner where these guys understood that I was doing work. I was respected. And then you had the Ruggiano family, obviously know me since I'm a kid. And that always gave me that, uh, you know, that treatment and, and treated me as an equal to them. They didn't look at me in a different way. And I think, you know, somewhere during the, this nonsense era of what goes on with computers, you know, you, you find yourself trying to explain that to people that don't understand the life like you do. So when you understand the life, uh, people respect a couple of things in this life, and that's uh, violence and money. If you can do those two things, uh, you're exceptional on the street. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the line of command, just to make it really, really simple, what would that? Who would you answer to? Then, John, who would you answer to first? As a kid, you know, it definitely was the Ruggiano family. That's who was the sitting boss in our neighborhood. When he goes to jail, Fat Andy uh, goes to prison, and he's in and out of jail several times since I'm a kid that I was around. But when he goes for the one long bid, uh, that's when Gotti steps in his shoes. I mean, actually, Gotti and all these guys, everybody in our neighborhood answered to Fat Andy Ruggiano. It's just that he was a very quiet gangster. People don't really know that out in the, in the public world. I'm probably the first guy who started talking about this in the last you know, five years about it. This guy was an ins sensational gangster that his name's not really publicly known the way uh, most uh, guys like Capone or somebody's names because he was a, a different human being. He was very quiet, but very dangerous. It certainly changed, John, you know, where, you know, the main goal of the life was to be under the radar, <laughs> was to not draw attention, was to not be known, not be seen. And none of your activities leveraged or you know in the public eye or anything like that it was always going to be bad so you know it's really really changed right you know but we'll get back to that but i'm putting that contrast there or when we look at them real old guys at how they was really schooled and the values they had and what they didn't want you know and where that really pivoted later on you know you know with john gotti senior did you like john gotti senior yeah, you know, I was, you know, people ask me, I love John Gotti Sr. Actually, I, you know, I didn't believe in a lot of his ways as I got older. I made some comments because I've been mad over the years with some of his actions. But the guy, you know, I love the guy. The guy was a gangster. The guy treated me like a son. And uh, I was around the family. So, you know, when people you know, like yourself, you just talk about, you know, I try to be under the radar, but it was very hard. Uh, you know, being around the father and, and to stay under the radar. So, you know, just recently, you know, pictures are coming out with me picking up Gotti Sr. from court. And that was in the Vanity Fair magazine. I'm coming out of his house. 
and there's tons of pictures that people say in, in an era when there was really no cameras. And, you know, I got some videos that come out from the Ravenite. I got three of them. I won't put them out. And, you know, people say, well, why wasn't he ever on a video at the Raven? At first, you know, I, you know, our life was to try to stay off those videos. But unfortunately, like you said, a lot of us get caught on those videos because God, he was a flashy guy. So, you know, those videos are out there and I'll put them out eventually. I'm not putting them out. I'm, I'm using them for other things and projects that we're in the middle of doing uh, with Fat Andy's son, Anthony. We're in the middle of some projects. So that, that'll go out eventually. But it, it, to me, there's no reason to put them out. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, a guy like yourself, who's a gangster, ex-gangster, we understand each other. We understand through bullshit. That's why we're alive. We, we can see through it. We know who's real, who ain't real. So this isn't about the public. This is about our own lives and how we conduct ourselves now. So, uh, you know, eventually uh, I will put some of the other stuff out too. But, you know, there's no sense to keep, you know, you're getting caught on these pictures. I'm usually the quiet guy that you see in the background of a picture, every picture. So, you know, and, and that was our life, to try to stay quiet. And Fat Andy again, Albert and Anthony, they, they taught us, and that's the way I was raised as a kid, They're, you know, especially with Anthony and Albert because they were, you know, a little older than me, 10 and five years older than me that uh, – I'd understand to follow the way their father wanted things. Angelo, Angelo Della Croce as well. Did you know him well? I don't know. You know, these guys, you know, people will say to me, did you know, when you don't have, I'm a kid, you know, they'll say hello to me. How you doing, kid? And that's it. You keep it moving. Mm -hmm. You have no, you, especially then the life is, was very, we were taught a certain way. We weren't allowed to go speak to a boss if we felt like it. We weren't allowed to speak to an underboss. We were allowed to say hello to him and keep it moving. It was different with Anthony and Albert and, and Fat Andy because I grew up around the house and they were my coaches. And, you know, so you could talk to the father different than you could talk to another guy because you're almost like his grandson or something. You know, so, you know, it was a different thing. But, you know, we, we follow rules and regulations in our life. And so a lot of these guys, all you're going to do is say hello and goodbye. Unless you've got business and unless they're asking you to do a piece of work for them or something, then you're going to have a conversation with somebody, but not even direct usually back then. Yeah, of course. So when you go, when was the first bit of serious work that you've done for the Gambino family, John? You know, the first bit of serious work. You know, you're a bit older now. Let's go forward a little bit. And, you, you know, you're older now. What was the first bit of serious work? Uh, one of the, you know, I did a couple of things uh, for Gotti himself. And, you know, I'm talking about butchering guys, whether it was stabbing them or batting them. And then eventually uh, I got a conduit through the son with the Irish guy that he was staying with. They got robbed for about uh, four or 500 pounds of uh, pot. And they asked me to go on on the hit, and we were going to shoot some Jamaican kids, which we end up shooting. Uh, the the Irish guy was the shooter; I was the driver. And the reason why I'm saying the Irish guy doesn't have so many names, and if I keep saying it, he's another John, by the way, so there's too many Johns to keep saying John. So uh, you know, he was the shooter. After the shooting, he was high while he did the shooting, and so I wasn't happy about that. And then after the after the hit, I made a left hand turn, and he jumped out of the car and left the gun with me. So, you know, eventually we hit him for a lot of reasons, this guy, but one of them was he was involved in a, a gang rape and one it was, it was in the back of my mind to hit him because he left me in that car. So that was always part of that hit also in, in the back of my mind. But, uh, you know, that was probably one of the first hits I went on. And then after that, it became a regular thing. I went on shooting after shooting. And, uh, you know, it, it, for the people that don't understand that life, after you do one or two shootings or even one, and the boss doesn't okay what you're doing, I would have been chopped up. I would have been chopped up by Fat Andy if he didn't like what I was doing or his sons would have killed me or uh, Gotti himself would have had me killed. So you don't do what I do uh, without everybody giving you permission for the way I'm running around. That's a, that's a very important point, John, for people who don't understand right, their life, right? Now, look, you know, there's a big list of people here, right, John? I'll just go into a couple of them just to give them a flavor, right? Yeah. You, know, you can give me the story around these guys. I know we can go on and on with some of these names, right? But look, you know, look, Louis de Bono. Louis, Louis de Bono was uh, supposed to be hit originally, and uh, they called the hit off. Uh, Sammy was involved in it. And actually, I just had this conversation with Sammy. I thought he was in jail when he got called off, but uh, he was on the street. Uh, Gotti sent a message out to us to hit him. The son met with me. I had a meet with the guy, Bobby Borrello, I was very close with. He gets killed later on over the uh, Paul Castellano. Hit, they hit him in front of his house. 
and uh, they tell me to go kill Louis de Bono. So I try to start, start setting that up. I was supposed to hit him in Atlantic City. We don't find him into New York City, and he gets hit there. But uh, he was also a made guy with us. Why, John? People will I'm just saying, you know, because there are so many. It's so treacherous. And usually when it comes like that, it's advanced. You're not seeing it coming. It really can be fucking anything at that point. But why, people will say, okay, why? Well, why, why Louis de Bono at this time, John? You know, it's as simple as this what people understand. Uh, we, we, we live in a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. So when my boss tells me to go kill somebody, I can't say, well, I put my hand up and say, I don't think we should kill him. It doesn't work like that. So he tells us to kill somebody, we kill him. If Anthony asked me or if his father sent the message and say, hey, let's go beat this guy, kill this guy, we don't question his father. And later on, when you talk to Anthony, he'll tell you his father sent messages on a constant basis. Go kill this guy, go kill that guy. If it's up to these guys that are, you know, because these are old school uh, gangsters. These are guys in an era of when they went out and they went to war and they brought their Tommy gun with them. It's not these days when, you know, it was, it was the 50s, it was the 60s. So when they send out an order, uh, you know, I'm just the guy that's going to go execute that order. So, you know, that's my job. And uh, so I'm not questioning what the boss says and why. I didn't believe he should get hit, to be honest with you. But again, this is not my decision. That's another good point, John. Thanks for that. Frankie Kiki. Frankie Kiki gets killed for several reasons. And, you know, Anthony's sitting on the side of me here. He raised his hand uh, to his mom. Uh, so he was dead no matter what. And then he also took a machine gun at a place called Butterfingers and tried to shoot Jojo Carrazzo, who was later on becomes a concierge of our family. So for those two reasons, he was getting chopped up and killed. Again, they, they call me up at two in the morning. And they tell me to go look for him and, uh, you know, try to set up the murder, which later on Anthony's involved with killing his uh, brother-in-law because of those things I just talked about. And again, he could be Fat Andy's son or not. That order comes down. He's going to do that work whether he likes it or not, or he's going to get killed. So that's just the way, uh, you know, we operate is like any other, uh, whether it's the Army or then we bring this up all the time, Marines. You're taking an order from your general and you're going to carry it out whether you like it or not. There are rules, absolutely. And on that point, on that point, John, uh, speaking about that, Frankie Kiki, explain to the audience what, in that dynamic, what actually happens to the loose cannons, to the people who stray. The most famous one, you know, would be uh, uh, a guy like Joey Gallo. Did you know Joey Gallo? Yeah, Joe Gallo. I know. Yeah, I didn't know first. I'm a kid, but yeah, I know these guys. I knew, I knew. Uh, you know, his kid Blast, his brother Al. You know, Al Gallo, I know me at a place down in Mulberry Street. We used to go eat at Casa La Bella. So, you know, these, and these are prolific killers, tough guys. And, you know, but listen, when you're in this life, we all know the rules. And if we break those rules, uh, you know, in our neighborhood, you know, guys are used to hearing one or two people dying. In our neighborhood, and I talk about it all the time, I, I put a list together about 100 guys that got killed. So, you know, it's no small list. If you do something wrong and if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and you're warned, that's why I wouldn't be sitting here today if I wasn't able to do what I did by the orders of my bosses. Uh, you know, this is the next guy, whether it would be Anthony. We'll use him as an example. You know, I've been around the family since I'm a kid. If I do the wrong thing and his father says, you got to kill him. I mean, I understand the life. You know, it's nothing personal. He loves me. We love each other. We're friends. Our families are friends. But at the end of the day, uh, it's an order. If he doesn't do it, he gets killed. And if, and if, and if he doesn't do it to me, don't worry. There's going to be another guy behind him that's going to kill me. So that's just part of us. Yeah, you know, that's very clear. Vito Guzzo. Vito Guzzo was a, a guy that grew up with me since he's about six years old. Tough guy. He's been shot a couple of different times. Uh, his friends, they, they tried to kill me several times. Uh, they were all in America's Most Wanted, different thing they were involved. His father was a Colombo guy who got hit. Vito killed the guys that hit him. They tried to hit me, and I ordered the, the murder on Vito Guzzo through our family again. I had nothing really uh, at that time. I was trying to actually uh, get friendly with Vito and take over some things. But at that time, the treachery between both of us and the killing never worked out. And we tried to hit him. He got shot about five times, survived it, and he killed one of the hitters. So, you know, again, that's back to the life of, uh, you know, these are serious guys. Vito is a serious guy in the street and his guys. And I've talked about him before, his crew of guys, Cookie and these guys are – uh, legitimately tough fucking guys. Cookie got shot in the head and neck. He survived it. And some of the other guys, unfortunately, didn't survive it. And fortunately, I survived it. Yeah, you know, for me even, you know, just to come on the back of that, John, I mean, when I think back to the life that I had, 
within that for me. Kind of prison, police, you know, organised squads and all that was the least of my problems, really. I was more concerned with who caught who first and how I was moving and who knew what and all this stuff. I, I, you know, I mean, it's a terrible way to have to live, John. You know, I have to be, looking back, it's suicidal, right? But look, I want to ask you, how was them times for you in the middle of that stuff? You know, you, you every day you put on your pants and you know this and you walk out the door, uh, you start your car or you, you walk into a place that you're a little drunk and you're not, you know, you're, you're not got your full wits. You can lose your life that day. So mm -hmm. and not only lose your life, but you can lose it in, in, in a really bad way. It depends on who's going to get you. If they torture you, tear your body apart before they kill you. And in my case, because of all the violence I did, that would definitely be my ending. So, you know, when people say to me about today, you got to eventually say to yourself, I'm, I'm retired, I'm done. I mean, because after a while, you're tired of the action, tired of killing. It's nothing to go back and do what we used to do. We all know we can do that anytime we feel like it. It's just when do you say it's enough? Because you can't kill the whole world that are talking. You can't kill the whole world that is, you know, coming after you because this ain't going to stop. It's either you got to put an end to it one way or another, which I did. And, and say, you know what, let the guys talk. I mean, I'm done. I'm retired. I don't have the crown anymore, whatever word you want to use. But we understand that the life is treachery and death. You know, it's not, uh, you know, I say it every time at the end of my show, crime doesn't pay unless you want to pay with your life. Yeah, and uh, Sammy, Sammy Gravano, you know, we're going to go forward a little bit, but I'm interested, just before the hit on uh, Paul, Paul Castellano and, you know, all of that stuff that happened there, right? You know, about the drugs. I know you was heavily involved with the heroin business then, John, at that time, just before that and coming up, right? right? Was you aware of stuff that was going to happen down to this dealing drugs within that life, knowing the way them rules were very strict, especially for the, for the other guys and the made guys? Yeah, I mean, I grew up again with, you know, with all these guys. And so I was involved in the heroin trade with them on a, a small level. I was big in the Coke business. And Sammy was an outsider, actually. People don't understand that. He became the underboss, but he wasn't the insider with Fat Andy Ruggiano or John Gotti or anybody else. He was a Brooklyn guy that, you know, it's, he's, a, he's a working partner is the best way I can say it, going to a regular company. But he wasn't family or friend. And there's a big difference on the level of trust of a guy with Gotti and him and or Fat Andy and some of these guys. Fat Andy's partner was Tony Lee, who was like his brother, who was very close to the family. And these are the guys that you depend on. You're not going to depend on an outside guy to do any work for you. So if I needed something, I would go obviously to Anthony or Albert like I did because I know I could trust them like family members. I'm not going to go to an outside guy and ask him, can you help me hit a guy? Because you don't have that trust value. And the same thing with you know, with Sammy, people don't know. John never wanted me friendly with him. I said hello to him here and there because John wanted me to hit him eventually. You know, and, and people don't get why didn't John want me to be friendly with this guy. There's only one reason. I'm friendly with everybody else. I wasn't allowed to talk to him besides hello and goodbye. So these are the things, the treachery in the life that John was smart enough to say, eventually I'm going to kill this guy. Whether he didn't like him, whether he was jealous of him, whether he didn't trust him, whether, you know, I don't know what those reasons were in John's head. I'm not allowed to question that. All I'm allowed to do is when he told me don't talk to him, I knew I couldn't talk to say hello and goodbye, and that's about it. And, you know, and that day might have came for Sammy if they don't get pinched. Who knows? Yeah, this is, a, this is a real example of, you know, the advanced cleverness. We would know about how to move bodies around and play right. against Paul and definitely don't. And, you know, it's all designed, right? You know, it's Machiavellian design, but it's unbelievably clever you know we're talking live and dev here which makes you so good at it because you have to be good at it or you die it's as simple as that you know right. and you learn from people long but who, who have just so much so much to teach you and you listen well right you know you listen well so look i've got to ask you about uh john senior and sammy now there's a lot about that you know out there about the end about the end of it what are your views on it John? Well, first off, when they're getting pinched in the 1990, my detective is Phil Baroni, who was also on a murder with me. We killed a, a guy that everybody's familiar with because they asked me the question about the guy, Georgie, on a regular basis. Phil was with me when we killed him. Phil's the one that gave me the information from another guy, Coffee, that was going to pinch John at the time. So they got a head start and they knew from me 
uh, I gave them the information they were going to get pinched. So I'm going to work from that point back now. So mm. coming back from that, you had a lot of, you know, you, you have two different sets of crews. You had Sammy that was well known in Brooklyn. And, you know, he had the connections with guys like Frankie DeChico and guys, you know, in the Brooklyn faction. He, he had relationships across the board. John had a little different situation. John had some personal serious killers that were very loyal to him since he was kids. That was Johnny Koenig and, and guys like that. And that grew up with Mark Ryder, even though he wasn't a killer like that. But they grew up ch each other since they're children. And then he had Eddie Lino and Tony Roach and certain guys. who He had his own faction of serious killers. But again, even though we're all together, we're kind of separate. And people really don't understand that. So if John had to go to somebody, he would go to somebody like his brother Jeannie and, and, and uh, Johnny Koenig. He wouldn't go to Brooklyn because Brooklyn was working relationship partners. It's a, it's a completely unique, different situation. And very, and you know, again, you, we're trying to talk to people and that are listening to us that are laymen. They really don't understand the intricacies of, of this life. So Sammy and John always had some sort of animosity towards each other, even though they worked with each other. And that underlining, I, I, you know, whatever the problem was between them, I don't really know because I'm not going to sit there and ask John, why are you telling me you don't talk to Sammy? Why don't you trust Jan Sammy fully? And then on Sammy's end, he's going to have his own reasons of why he says what he says. So, you know, the problem I had with John was uh, gangster, 100%, uh, you know, just, but he had some faults. His faults was, uh, you know, the notoriety. He, he wanted the notoriety. It destroyed all of us. And, uh, you know, he, he was, listen, he's one of the smartest Machiavelli guys around. And I think, in my opinion, I've said this on several occasions, I don't believe there was any reason to hit Paul Castellan. I think John used it as an excuse to step up and take a position that he wanted to take, and he knew it was his chance. And he knew that he can control guys, and he was very good at controlling guys. Nobody better than John, I could say, that really knew how to master people. And, you know, so that's some of the good things about John. And uh, one of the other things about John is when you socialize with him, he was, a, he was a, a, a gentleman. He went out. He liked to have fun. We drank and it was broads and we traveled and we went to Florida on boats. And, I mean, he knew how to have a good time. So he did let his hair down, but very rarely in front of a lot of people. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I mean, I spoke to Mark, Michael Francis, right? You know, he he said the same thing about John. You know, he's great, great to go out with, great guy to have fun with. He was very tough, you know. And you can say what you want about John Gotti, but for me, I've always liked people who was what they said they was, and they went out on their feet, and they went right to the end. And they called it how it, you know, how it was, right? You know, he certainly done that. We all have flaws, right? You know, and the thing is to manage these. This is one. This is one of the big things in life is to identify them and manage them. You know, so that you know that's what I would say. But look, I have to ask you as well, John, about Sammy says, "Oh, this guy wasn't straight with me and all that." You know, you know what the story is out there. What's your view about that? What's your clear view about that, John? Uh my, my view is like, you know, again, John didn't care about money. That's one thing about John. He, he spent it. He gambled it. He didn't, he didn't particularly like guys like Michael Francis. You know, that's no secret. Michael knows that. He liked guys like Fat Andy Ruggiano. He loved Fat Andy. He was around Fat Andy since he was a kid before he got in the position. He loved guys to be like me. He wanted us to be rough and tough. And this is what he liked. So with John, uh, he didn't want to hear so much about the business. He didn't care. So that's where I could see him and Sammy bumping heads. He didn't. He didn't. Did not care about the money. Give him the money, and he'll go spend the money. But if he had a hundred thousand, he gambled a hundred fifty thousand, and he gambled like that. So for the people that don't know, they used to play Continental for two days straight. He lose a quarter of a million dollars back in the eighties, like it was nothing. So you know, when somebody says, "Well, did John care about money?" John, like anything else, he likes some nice things for the moment. He wasn't a guy worried about next year. He wasn't a guy that said, oh, this money's going to rule me. So if you had 200000 and he wanted to spend it on gambling, he'd take it and spend it. But if he had 100000 and you didn't have a penny, he'd give you the whole 100000 also. So, you know, John had a, a unique personality that way. And that's what made him so likable and lovable that guys really liked him. So people say, why do you like the guy so much? He just had a unique personality. He had a charisma about him that the rest of his family never had. Nobody. Not his brothers, anybody. He was just a unique guy. So I think, again, that relationship between him and Sammy is a, 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 an ego thing. 
that was going on, underlining of everything else that was going on. So I think eventually uh, that popped. And I, and I think one of the things is because, again, that, that Paul hit should have never been done. I don't care what they say. He had two cases going at the time, Paul. He wasn't killing nobody. In my opinion, Paul's never killing anybody. Roy DeMeo, DeMeo's already gone. He had, you know, Testa and Santa kill Roy right before that. And, you know, you, you were in a position where there's two major cases going against you. I don't think you're going to make that move. I think John just was smart enough to manipulate that move into to what he said. And he took over the hit. And uh, he had the rest of these guys follow him. Guys can say what they want. They all followed him. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you have to admit, you, know, you can say what you want, but it's, you know, it shows a lot of cleverness for that life, for the mob life, right? For that life, you know, 100% was a and, clever guy. You know, you want to come up, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a unbelievably clever move, you know, which takes, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of bollocks as well. It's the aftermath where it come, you know, it come undone. And that was the bit that had to be, had to be managed, you know, well, go in there and do what you have to do. You know, I've heard you say it, John. It's not that hard. Let's be, let's be honest. You know, to go and do what you have to do, really, especially when you're leveraged into it, is not that hard. Let's be honest. It's what comes after, right? Is 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 harder, right? Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, they picked us apart after that Paul hit. People that in the, in the public don't realize they kill about seven of our guys. We don't kill anybody back. I mean, we're getting hit left and right after that. And, you know, who do you, who do you fire at first? You just started a war between several strong families, and then you have the adversaries in our own family on the, on the Castellano side that don't like it. So John was in a bad spot at the time. Once he did that, it was the, the beginning of the end because you got law enforcement on you. You're catching case after case. He, he caught about five, six dumb cases. Not dumb, but, you know, some of them were like the, when he knocks out a Russian guy. Some of these cases, you know, were, the heat was on him. It was 24-hour surveillance because of the notoriety that he put on himself. And then you have, you know, several RICO cases, the state, the Fed. So it was the beginning to the end. So now how do you start asking guys to hit more guys while our guys are getting hit? And then it's all over the news. So you had, you know, like guys like Joey Scopel was very loyal to Gotti Sr. And he took over a faction of the Colombo family. He gets one of the last murders in 92, 93, whenever you get a hit. And I think it was the end of 92. So once these things start going... Uh, there's no way to fight back. And he put himself in a bad spot, Senior. He's getting hit with cases and he's all over the media and our guys are getting clipped at the same time. So yeah. it was a disaster of a decision, I say. I've always said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, history and posterity, John, have made it so, you know, and made it yeah. a fact that this was the beginning and the end for all the five families, you know, the New York, La Costa Nostra, certainly. I want to go back a little bit to your, you know, to your journey, right? Because it, it started to get very hot for you, as it does, and you're doing these things. And look, you know, I mean, I've heard you said it as well that they never had a case against you. You know, there wasn't no forensics. You wasn't caught with a smoking gun, you know, or anything like this, right? Let's make that really clear. But you went to South America, right? You went to Brazil. Do you want to take us through a little bit um, what happened there, why you had to do that, and what was going on? Well, I, I went on a run. Uh, I left the country in about 2003 in March, I believe. After I was in and out of jail for since 96, I kept going in and out of jail, getting hit with different cases. And uh, when I go on a run, I go to a lot of countries. I was with the cartel in Colombia. They moved me over to Venezuela, an army base. I was in Cuba. So, you know, I left Cuba and I ended up going to Brazil eventually after 20 countries. I had some help from friends of mine, a boss of uh, Denmark, who I'm still very good friends with. He helped me get pass the passports and he helped me move around Spain and different countries in Europe. But uh, I go on that run and, you know, when I'm there, the guys are flipping left and right. Uh, bosses of several families, uh, you know, giving what we call 302s and sitting with the government and giving statements and trying to weasel out of their problems. And they all put it on me. And so, you know, those paperwork isn't my word. It's the reality of that life, the treachery, that when it comes down to it, boss, on the boss, doesn't matter what title they give themselves, uh, when the trouble hits and they know they're in a box, they're going to point and, and, and try to get out from under it, and they gave me up. Right, John, so, you know, all these guys, they start turning on you, right, you know, and, you know, people can say what they want. You know, they've said that you've turned on them and all that. But look, you know, we know in that world, John, that, you know, if someone informs on you, how can you inform on them? 
because they've informed on you. I mean, that's a really simple one, right? But look, what do you say to that? What do you say to that, John? I have to ask you your view on that. Uh, you know, I, I sit here with my friend next to me and I sit with you in front. You guys know the street. Paperwork don't lie. You know, I tell everybody the same thing. Just check the paperwork. These guys were giving me up. There's no way you can turn that around. Once they started sitting with the feds and giving me up, it's over. That life for me was done once you guys start turning me in and giving me up. I never got caught. I left my family, went on the run. It's as simple as that. I owe you nothing once you start informing on me. And anybody that says anything different, they got to have rocks in their head because this is about self-preservation and life. This is not about, you know, I go rob a bank with you and I go tell the feds and you sit there and say, yeah, I did it. Now, what dummy's going to do that? So, you know, these guys are not understanding our life and, and the treachery. And paperwork, again, I say it all the time. Timelines and paperwork are factual. Not my word, not anybody else's word. Just get the paperwork and it will show that uh, everything I'm saying is accurate. This is a good time, John, I think, you know, to get uh, Anthony uh, Ruscio in. Anthony Ruscio, his, uh, his father, Andy, you know, he was a main, a main capo. Now, this is going back to the real old school. Cool guys, you know, you're talking Alba, Alba mm -hmm. Anastasia, you know, the people who put the foundation down for the American mob, especially the New York mob, pretty much. Is that fair to say? Oh, and definitely. It's nice to be on your show also. Yeah, that's definitely fair to say. My father got straightened out in the 1950s when the mob was the mob. So what do you say about what John was saying, Anthony, about, you know, just to say your piece, on what John was saying about how it turned, how it turned with this Gotti thing and how it really was for your father, you know, and them old school guys, the real old school guys back in the day. Well, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, my father took me to a butcher shop in Brooklyn and the guy was behind the counter cutting meat and he turned around and he had his butcher apron on and he was cutting meat and him and my father went into the back of the butcher shop and I stood out by the counter and my father came out from the butcher shop and we walked out and we walked into the car and I said, Dad, who was that guy? He said, that guy is a wise guy. I said, a wise guy? He's a butcher. He goes, yeah, he's a wise guy. Fast forward 30 years, I'm walking down the street with John Gotti and people are asking for his autograph. <laughs> so. <laughs> what do you think? Here's a question. Here's a question, yeah. Anthony, right? What do you think the likes of Alba, Anastasia, you know, we're talking murder in gear. It's right. well documented, historic, iconic. What do right. you think them guys, like Alba, would have made of this, this Gotti thing and this press thing and how it all ended years later? They would have probably killed them. I mean, they didn't want publicity. I mean, I used to be in restaurants with John and people would walk over to the table and ask him for his autograph and he would give them his autograph. And Tony Lee, who was my father's partner, would get insane. Like, how could this guy do this? You know, he was the complete opposite of what they were. They were very low key, uh, very quiet. My father was always, I didn't know who my father was until I saw his name in the newspaper. My father, I, I didn't know who he was a wise guy. I mean, I knew there was something going on. It was special because I knew when I was a kid and he took me with him on Saturdays to the bar, how he was treated. He was treated different than a normal person. And I was treated different. Like they would stick money in my pocket. They were like, you know. Steven, let me tell you something. I don't mean to cut you off. Yeah. You see how nobody really knows who he is? He's royalty of the mafia beyond royalty. But he had a different upbringing from his father of understanding what he's supposed to behave like. So people should know who he is or and his father is all over the world. Forget about one section because his father was the guy with Mur Mur Murder Inc. and Albert Anastasia. He was the, the Hall of Fame of gangsters, but yet they don't know. So this is the perfect example of how he was raised and how the father kind of tried to teach us to be raised. Right. My father was straightened out when the books were closed. In 1953, the books were closed. So to get straightened out, they had to open up the books in 56. But at 53, when they were closed, my father got strained out because he was a special case because he did work for Albert, him and another fella named Frankie Martin, who John knows. They did work for Albert. They were kids. They were only in their early 20s. And because of the work they did, which I mean, they committed murders for them, they got straightened out while the books were closed. They were special cases, which is very rare and a big honor in the mob to get straightened out when the books are closed. 
Fascinating, Anthony. It really is. Look, I want to ask you a question. In them days, for your experience of these guys, you know, these real iconic guys, what was they actually like? They were very respectful. They were very low key. And like John said, they were killers. You know, right was right and wrong was wrong. And um, it was just a different world. And they brought you up. They Like I was brought up from the bottom up. Like when I started working for my father at 16, he, he started me working in a blackjack game. He, my father got straightened out in 53. He was a doorman at a crap game. He was making $20 a night and he was a wise guy. And I started out the same way. I was 16. I was working in a blackjack game. Then I went to work in a crap game. Then I went to work in a poker game. Then I went to work in a number office. And they schooled us the way they were schooled. They were brought up to learn all every facet of the life and to be respectful and to be dangerous. My father told me a long time ago, don't underestimate anybody. Anybody could kill you. I have to say as well, you know, anyone with any brains, I don't care what they do or where they come from or what they think they have, what their experience as a mature, what they know about what human beings are capable of. You know, and they human, what human beings have in them, you know, to be taught the right way is jewels indeed, right? You know, and it, you know, really, and it is, it is, um, that is an unbelievable university of wisdom. Some people might not get that. Yeah. But a lot do, you know. I right. certainly do, you know. Uh, mm. Thanks, Anthony, for that. Really, is there anything else you would like you would like to tell us about them days? It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, my father told me a long time ago. Um, you know, just going to jail was all part of the job. You know what I mean? And he was just, and I did, and I did the time, and uh, you know, it was just a different world. It was respectful. We didn't wait on lines. It was just so glamorous, but yet. My, you know, our families suffered, people suffered. So, you know, there was always two sides to it. There was the glamorous side, and then there was the traumatized side. Like my daughter, she's traumatized from all the time I did in prison. So, you know, um, the question is, was it worth it for me? That's the question for me. Was it worth it? How long did you do in prison, Anthony? I mean, I, you know, I've done 17 uh, years myself. I've done a little I, bit. I, I did 14 years altogether, 14 years. Mm. The last one I did was eight years and three months. And and it's funny because of, John, like John was saying about my father, I'll just tell you this before we go. So every time I went to prison because of my father and because of the mob, so in nine, I did my first bid in 1978. So I was in re, in a reception center in Clinton in Dannemora State Prison with two co-defendants, my friend Sal and my friend Frankie. So the three of us are there on the same case. We got designated to go to prisons. Frankie and Sal got designated to go to a prison camp, which is the minimum security, no fence, no, it was like being free. They got designated to go to a camp and I got designated to go to Comstock prison, which, nickname, was, which was nicknamed Gladiator School. So they went to prison camp and I went to Gladiator School because I was Fat Andy's son. Okay. Uh it's wonderful you're yeah. home, Anthony. <laughs> wonderful I'm home, you know. And John, look, guys, listen, you know, it's been fascinating talking to you. Really. I could talk to you for hours, Anthony, about you yeah. know, all them guys and you, John. Thanks. We'll come back another time, you know, and I'd love that. But look, you know, thanks, thanks, thanks for, for coming on the big shift, you know, and going through some of this stuff for people out there. I know they're going to find it fascinating. I like the truth. I like to really get down to it. I know we've had a lot of truth here tonight. We've gone through things in a simple way, you know, and I hope a lot of a lot of people out there are a lot more informed, you know, about what this life is like and um, about your journey, certainly, John, and yours, Anthony, and even mine. You know, so thank you guys for coming on. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, Stephen, if they're looking for us, you can go on a True John A. Light Instagram <laughs> for me. On, I got a new book coming out in about six weeks for people that are interested. And Absolutely. Uh, looking forward to talking to you. I'll meet you soon. I'll be in the UK shortly with Anthony. We're doing a project over there again. So we'll, we'll be over there shortly. We can meet. Absolutely. And, yeah. um, you know, you've got, you've, got, you've got your own channel. You've got a lot of books, a lot of content out there, guys. I really recommend you go and look at John's stuff. You know, a lot of raw stuff in there. Really uh, fascinating content for people who want to understand more. Thank you guys for coming on. Th thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate it, Stephen. See you guys. Thanks for tuning in, guys. 
to a wonderful new segment of The Big Shift with Stephen Gillen. Make sure to subscribe, like, go into stephengillen.com and sign up for more wonderful content to expedite, help and support you on your own personal journey of success.